Welcome to this presentation about standardization of extracellular vesicle research. My name is Berta Bettin and I'm a PhD student at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers. And I'd like to start this talk by jumping right into the topic of the reproducibility crisis. So researchers continuously publish new discoveries and new results. And that's really good, right? Because new publications and new research motivate further research and they also inspire new products. So if we talk about products, we could, for example, think about uh, treatments for cancer. And but that's that also means that it's really important that we have confidence and that we have trust in the data and the results that are published. But unfortunately, there are many studies out there um, that are very difficult, if not even impossible to reproduce. And um, the thing about that is that if you have irreproducible results, this can lead to delay in patient treatment, for example. It can lead to a waste of the time of the patients and the researchers as well. And then it also can uh, lead to a waste of resources. So it is very important that we can trust our own data, first of all, but that we can also trust the data that is generated by others. And one, ex or like one situation that you actually don't want to have is that uh, someone comes to you and says, I'm sorry, man, but we just can't trust you, as you can see here on the right. Um, so the question is, how can we improve reproducibility? And the key to that is standardization. And um, if you look into a dictionary, we could find um, a definition of standardization saying that it means to bring into conformity with a standard especially in order to assure consistency and regularity. Or in more simple words, you could also say that it means to make things of the same type all have the same basic features. And we have the International Society for Standardization, in short ISO, and they actually ensure standardization. And they say that you can just think about standardization as a formula that describes the best way of doing something. And they even take it a step further by saying that if things do not work out as they should, it often just means that standards are absent. So that simply means that without standardization or that without having a standard, it is difficult to do anything. And um, standardization also plays a role in our daily life. And, and I brought an example or actually two examples of that. Because I think that standardization really plays a, like a role in our daily life, but we are often not very aware of that. So standardization, for example, is also involved amongst other things, of course, in education. It's also involved in uh, gender equality, sustainability, also um, in health and in research. And the two examples that are brought here, like that I'm showing here, are that we can actually just go to the supermarket and buy potatoes by weight in kilogram, for example. Or um, if you think about that, we, we can actually measure the distance between our house and our friend's house in meter. So using the uh, international system of units for that, uh, to express this. Um, and I think of more, even, like an even more prominent example that I brought here is that, and I guess everyone charges their phone or at least once a day, is that, um, yeah, we use a charger to charge our phone or to charge our laptop or other technical devices that we are using. So why is standardization actually so important for us? It actually allows us to compare results from, from instruments and also from other institutes. And um, one example of that could be that it allows us to develop reliable biobanks. So that's more tailored to research now, of course. Um, and then the, um, in, an example for the vesicle field could be that standardization is the prerequisite for EV biomarker research, because we first need to have this in place before we can go uh, and do biomarker research and start multi-center studies. Yeah. So, what does actually happen if we don't have standardization? So without standardization, without standardization, um, data comparison is impossible. It's a bit of it's a bit like comparing apples and oranges. 
And I think a good example of that is and that most people in research can relate to is that if you think about laboratories, they simply use different equipment, right? So we use different centrifuges, we use different cubes, and we use different techniques to detect vesicles. So a flow cytometer is just one example here. And that as such is not a problem, but this already introduces differences maybe in the, in the outcome of your experiment. And one way to circumvent that basically is to do standardized reporting, which is a part that I'll talk about um, in more detail later during this presentation. And uh, also that the one thing is that if we don't have standardization, we don't have standardized measurements, and we also lack standardized reporting. And that brings me back to, to the point that I started my presentation with the reproducibility crisis, um, because without standardization, we have uh, no reliable, like, reliability and also um, a reproducibility issue. So one part of standardization is data comparison. And one tool actually to, to achieve data comparison or data comparability is calibration. And calibration simply describes a process in which measured arbitrary units are related to standard units. So that means that, for example, if we think about the flow cytometer here again, the scatter signal that we are collecting with our instrument is related to a diameter in nanometer. And one thing I'd like to mention here as well is that a calibration requires a traceably characterized reference material. I'm not going into detail here, but I'd like uh, people to understand that simply running beats is not a calibration, but you also need to apply this to your data. And I'm going to show an example of calibration in a second. Um, and one thing that uh, calibration does for us basically is that it enables us to do data interpretation properly. So if you think about the example that I gave before that you relate your scattering signals to diameter, um, and if we think about vesicles, we could, we, yeah, we, we know that we are in the size regime that vesicles should have and that we actually didn't detect cells here. Um, it also enables us to do data comparison. And one more thing I'd like to mention here is that it also provides the detection range and the sensitivity of the instrument that you're using, which is also really important if it comes to data comparison, because you want to compare your data uh, within the same uh, ranges. So as I said, I brought a little example here of um, a calibration, or in this case, a fluorescent calibration of flow cytometry. So what I did is I measured the same sample that contains ve contained vesicles on two different flow cytometers. Um, so we just call them instrument A and instrument B here because this is just one example of how something like this could look like, or calibration could look like. Um, so yeah, black shows the instrument A, red dotted line shows instrument B. And what you can see here is the uncalibrated data. So the counts that we measured in a given amount of time and the fluorescent intensity in arbitrary units. So that means that the fluorescent intensity we measured is specific for this instrument or in, yeah, for each of the instruments. So what you see is that the data of or like the counts in our vesicle and the fluorescent intensity as well um, in our vesicle sample differs. And that's something we don't expect because we think like same sample, both measured on a flow cytometer, why would you see this difference, right? So, but the problem is because we are in the arbitrary unit regime here, or we are in arbitrary units here, we cannot interpret the data and we can also not compare it between instrument A and instrument B. Plus, on top of that, um, the sensitivity plus the dynamic range of the instruments cannot be compared. That's something that I'll not um, tackle during this, this talk, but there are resources out there where you can um, learn more about that. So what I did is I performed a calibration. Uh, a fluorescent calibration. So I ran two. So I told you before that I think that like taking a step back is better to explain this here. So um, a calibration requires reference materials, right? Um, 
And in this case, I chose to use MESF beads. Um, MESF stands for Molecules of Equivalent Soluble Fluorochrome. And these are beads that uh, come with specified fluorescent intensities, which are provided by the companies that produce these beads. So what I did to, to create this graph is I ran the MESF beads on the two instruments. So again, black shows instrument A and red shows instrument um, B. I ran them on the two instruments and then I looked at the median fluorescent intensity in arbitrary units for each of the bead populations, which you can actually see here by the symbols along the lines. Um, and it's really important that you also measure this MESF beads as, at the same settings as you measure your vesicles at because you want to use this calibration later for your vesicle sample. Um, what I did next, and that's something um, that resulted in making this graph, is I log transformed the data. That's because um, with, with, for this regression, I want to avoid that the that, uh, that there is a bias by brighter bees that are in this bead mix. So afterwards, I fitted the measured arbitrary units that um, uh, I'm, yeah, the, the ones I measured, plus the specified MESF values, which I got from the company. And uh, yeah, so I fit it with this linear regression to relate the arbitrary units to standard units. And here you right away can see what this means. So uh, if we go up here, for example, and we look at the fluorescent intensity in arbitrary units, we can, by going to, to the left part of the graph, right away relate it to the MESF intensity that this would um, be. So I hope that this arrows help a bit with understanding the point I tried to make. So you can just take a given arbitrary unit um, intensity here and then relate it back to the MESF intensity. And what we did next is that we apply, so if you follow the, the um, line basically here, is that we applied this MESF fluorescent calibration to our data here on the right. Um, so you can see the fluorescence intensity again in MESF versus the counts that we measured in a given amount of time. And then you can see that the, the, the data of the two instruments, so instrument A and instrument B actually overlap. So that means we can now finally uh, interpret the data, but also compare the data because now we are in a standard uh, unit. So to wrap this up, I think it's important to, to mention that the that calibrating our data in general um, means that we standardize the data and that we thereby ensure data comparison between laboratories. But I think I would even take it a step further if I see the slide right here. It's not only between laboratories, but it could also be like, but like within your own um, laboratory as well, right? It could as well be that you have two instruments of the same type, or you try to look at the size of vesicles um, with two different instruments, then it's also a, a very important that you have standard units um, that you can yeah, compare between instruments, laboratories. Yeah. So the next part, I'd like to talk about data reporting. Uh, so beforehand, we talked about the data comparison, now we are at data reporting. So, and this is essential for standardization as well, because it helps us to improve reliability and also reproducibility of the experiments that we are performing. And this may include, for example, the experimental design, but also the pre-analytical arrival. So for example, if you think about, um, you wanna look at vesicles in a given biofluid, like how you, how you collect the biofluid and how you handle it, and until you can perform your analysis. Um, this also can include the, or should include not only, uh, yeah, right, should include the analytical variables and also data processing. And here I brought a couple of examples about data reporting, um, but I'm sure that there are also other examples out there or other guidelines out there for a specific um, body fluid or for specific types of ethicals that you wanna look at or interested in. The first one uh, that I'd like to mention is the minimal information for studies of extracellular vesicles, also known as the MICEF guidelines, um, which 
basically is a guideline for EV experiments and their requirements. So it could like it includes the EV quantification, but also protein and non-protein composition and vesicle detection. So it tells you about the details that you should pay attention to. If it comes to vesicle uh, experiments, and um, I highly recommend you to to read into this if you're starting up vesicle experiments. So if you're uh, new to the field, but also of course if you've been in the field for longer, but you've never looked at this, I highly recommend to you to look into that. Uh, the second um, <clears throat> paper that I'd like to mention is the MyFlowSite EV, which is a framework for standardized reporting of extracellular vesicle flow cytometry experiments. And um, so this is then more tailored to uh, EV flow cytometry. And while the mice have guidelines, for example, are more, are more general. Um, and this paper was published by the EV flow cytometry working group. So if you're interested in vesicle flow cytometry, I highly recommend you to look at this. And another example here is, I'd like to mention is the EV track knowledge base, which is for transparent reporting and centralization, uh, centralizing knowledge in extracellular vesicle research. And that was re, um, published by the EV track consortium. And in general, this is simply uh, a transparent reporting tool that summarizes also all the methods that people use to analyze vesicles once you filled in this database. So next, I'd like to talk about standardization studies. So because beforehand we talked about, okay, what do you need uh, for data comparison and what do you need for standardized reporting, right? And I think it's really important to mention that over the last couple of years, the awareness in the field has really grown that we need standardization. And I think a lot of these standardization studies really help us to uh, continuously improve standardization of uh, extracellular vesicle research, um, independent on what characteristic or like what type of vesicles you're you're looking at. And um, I think that this is especially important because to mention because if you really want to start multi-center studies and one day want to look at um, want to you know, have a EV based biomarker, for example then the first thing that needs to be in place is standardization. Then you can go to like add your own lab and then you can go to um, to compare it with other things. And again, these are just a couple of the studies that are out there on standardizing exocellular vesicles. And with this, I'd actually already like to come to the take home message. Um, and I just like to keep it simple. I just wanna say, calibrate, please calibrate your instrument to ensure data comparison. And then the second thing is please report experimental details. So report the experimental design and the pre-analytical variables that you're using, how you prepared the samples. Um, please also report the, the controls, how you calibrated your instrument and which settings you used to measure the vesicles, um, which vesicle characteristics you, uh, you looked at. And then one point that's also really important here as data sharing. But um, so if you want to know more details about that, I highly recommend you to look at the, the papers that I just showed here. And with that, I'd just like to quickly show you the reference list that I used to prepare this presentation. And with this, I'd like you. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, if you want to look at more lectures, please visit the website that's provided in this slide.